Hello and welcome. This is a video built to support students currently enrolled in the AP Research course, part of the AP Capstone program by the College Board. Hello researchers. This lesson has been constructed to help you move forward in your research process when you are working on the results, analysis, and conclusion elements of the academic paper. If you are still struggling with how to structure and transmit your argument and new understanding, this video is for you. My name is Emily Lott, a teacher from Chesity High School in Gainesville, Georgia, and I look forward to supporting you in this review session. Let's begin with a lesson overview so you know what to expect from this lesson. This lesson will help you craft and revise your approach to the res results, analysis, and conclusion elements of the academic paper. As you can see from the list of LOs, we have multiple concepts to cover in this video. Please remember the quest process is a recursive process that means you will often have to move through different concepts multiple times. At this point in the year, we are looking at focusing on understanding and analyzing your data, as well as the ideas in your research field, community of practice, and body of knowledge, evaluating the perspectives of the groups just mentioned, as well as the results of your own method, synthesizing those ideas discussed into an analysis and new understanding, and finally transmitting that information clearly and effectively to your reader and the community of practice. Let's get focused with a quick warm up. So reflect on your stage of the research process and where are you in that process? Have you generated a narrow, focused research question? Have you established a method aligned to your research question? And have you collected data based off of your method? Are you starting to analyze the results from your collection to generate a new understanding? Pause the video now to decide where you are in the research process. If you have not created your method at this time, perhaps you should go back to the AP Research Channel and find the lesson titled, Choosing and Aligning Your Research Method. But come back to this video when you're ready. If you have already completed your data collection and you are ready to move forward into analysis, stay with me. Once you have collected data, the second half of your academic paper should become your focus. And in this half of your work, you have one major goal, answer your research question. But of course, it's not enough just to write a simple answer and submit. There are multiple parts to answering your question that you must complete to increase the validity of your argument and the credibility of your conclusions. The following information has been pulled straight from our AP Research Academic Paper rubric. Take a moment to reach, read each column and then record the differences of each column. Pause the video now to do this. So, what did you recognize? Did you notice that the chart takes you from summary to conveys to supports to justifies? How does the chart talk about data? How about the words existing knowledge to insufficient evidence to sufficient evidence? Once you begin to study this chart, you realize that there's a lot to unpack in these five columns. So let's take some time to do that now. Let's level set together on some key terminology from the AP research course. First, we need to acknowledge all of the working elements that are part of the lesson today. Your results, products, or findings require you to present the findings, evidence, results, or product. Your discussion, analysis, or evaluation require you to first interpret the significance of the results, product, or findings, and explore those connections to the original research question or project goal. And then you must discuss the implications and limitations of the research or creative work. Your conclusions and future directions require you to first reflect on the process and how this project could impact the field and to suggest possible next steps for another researcher. Please remember, these are not necessarily individual sections in your academic paper. Each community of practice has different ways to format this type of writing. My suggestion, 
go back to the scholarly texts from your literature review to see how this part of their work is organized and how they choose to format their work. I am not encouraging you to plagiarize their scholarly work, but I am encouraging you to learn how your community of practice thinks about this part of the paper and then to become part of the community of practice, mirror their organization in your writing. This is a glossary slide for the lesson. You may want to take a moment to pause the video and re-familiarize yourself with these key terms, as I will use many of these terms in the lesson. If you hear a term that you're unfamiliar with, chances are I've captured it here. Feel free to come back to the glossary to further your knowledge of research terminology throughout this entire video. Our first discussion will consider the results, products, or findings element. Once you've collected data, you need to begin thinking about how to package this data for your readership. But packaging is not an easy process, and there are many ways to display your data. Reflect on information you gained earlier in this video. Where can you go to see how to package your data? If you said your community of practice or literature review, you're right. Each community of practice has different preferences when it comes to packaging data for research. Consider mirroring these practices in your own work. Remember, do not plagiarize by claiming other work as your own, but rather consider previous publications or scholarly work in your field as a set of guidelines or suggestions for this element. No matter the discipline, your results need to be clear, readable, and should lend well to support your analysis and conclusions element. To enhance your results section, consider the following possibilities for your academic paper. Preliminarily organize your research through descriptive statistics. Provide an explanation of your data backed by visuals. Include graphs to increase understanding. Carefully exhibit qualitative results so that readers can understand and consume your results easily. And then consider the process of coding data to establish analysis possibilities in the next element. Please know that not all graphs work for all types of data sets and visual goals. You should match the intention of your data with a common visual goal of a graph type. Let's look at some examples for further clarification. The following information describes a number of graphs that are commonly used to share data. When in the selection process for types of graphs, you should look at how these types are commonly used and what is required to set up your visualization. If you do not have the working parts required for setup, perhaps that is not the correct form of data visualization for your academic paper. Another way to think about this, which type of graph helps me begin to answer my research question? I want to walk you through a moment of rationale to further our discussion on this topic. Imagine you're conducting a study that collects data over time. Would you provide your results in a pie chart or a line graph? Pause the video to review these two options and make a decision. Of course, depending on the topic, the answer could be both but more than likely you will use a line graph that can show behaviors of your subject over time. And this brings me to a tip on pie charts. You may be tempted to use multiple pie charts in your data viz, which is totally normal. Pie charts are something that many of us find comforting and they're a tool we've known even before AP research. But here's the issue. If your research question is not considering the effects of some phenomenon on a portion of a group and you are not collecting data on the whole group, a pie chart might not be the right fit for your data. Know that I'm not against pie charts, but there are some better commonly, uh, commonly used graphs to have. And this is one of the most commonly misused visualizations which is a problem because a misuse of data viz can create confusion for your reader. Okay, okay, I'm sure you get the message. Just make sure you think about your research question. Think about how you plan to answer that question and then pick accordingly. Also, if none of the visualizations on this slide work for your paper, that's okay. There are plenty of resources on the web to help you decide. Take some time to investigate which data viz is right for you and your research question. 
Here are some things not to do in your academic paper regarding your results, products, or findings element. Do not summarize information from your literature review. And then do not needlessly repeat data in both writing and visuals. So let me explain the second one clearly. Imagine you created a bar graph from your data. If you created a bar graph clearly, you have all the parts label, labeled, including the X and Y axis. You have colors or shading or each uh, graph, uh, each bar with a key for your reader. So people can see very clearly which bar aligns with which concept. And you might even have qualifiers on the top of each bar to clarify your specific results. You do not need to then translate your bar graph word for word into your academic paper because your bar graph is working hard to do this ex explanation for you. Rather, you can go deeper with your results, pointing out potential trends or other pieces of information that will be critical to your analysis. Once you have discussed your findings, you will need to begin your analysis. In multiple fields, this element and the one just described are synthesized together, and that's totally fine. Just make sure you do not omit one element in the attempt to create the other. Once you've explained your preliminary results, you will need to slow down and take time to clearly build a line of, reason, of, excuse me, a line of reasoning that will support an answer to your research question. This means you need to interpret the significance of results, products, or findings, connect your results to carefully selected information from your literature review, and then explore those connections to your original research question and project goal. Because this is a very critical piece of your academic paper, I want to provide just a few organizational options, but I do have a question for you that you've already heard once or twice in this video. Where can you go to observe ways that your analysis can be constructed? Again, if you guess the scholarly works from your literature review or community of practice, you're right. Let me slow down just for a minute to clarify what I mean by organization. Organization is the process in which you build your analysis to help your audience follow your line of reasoning. Effectively, you are having to make conscious decisions about when and where to provide different parts of your argument. Deciding your organization before drafting is helpful, but if you've already started writing your analysis, don't worry. You can revise your organization by moving parts of your analysis around to enhance this organization and the communication of your argument. Before we talk about specific ways to organize your analysis, I want to remind you that no matter your organizational style, you must keep a line of logical reasoning. This is a skill you really harnessed in AP Seminar, so make sure to bring it back to AP Research too. Okay, let's talk about specific ways you can organize your analysis. First, you can present your analysis in the order in which data was collected. This is especially helpful for those individuals with mixed methods or are generating a process for creative research. One pro for this analysis structure is, it appears on the surface to be systematic and supportive of reader understanding. However, a con to this structure is that it does not allow for grouping in a way that deepens the understanding of data. Another way to organize your analysis is through category grouping. This means you are grouping prompt items into designated categories to allow for clear connections to your method instruments. You, may, uh, you might make these categories based off your intentions for different items used in your instrument for data collection. Examples are responses, interviews, or perhaps constructed, res uh, constructed responses from questionnaires. One pro for this analysis structure is that it allows the reader to make direct connections between the method instruments used to collect data and the response by the subject or participant. However, a con to this structure is that with large amounts of responses, information may be too difficult to organize into clear categories. Trend grouping is a great way to group item responses based on the responses rather than by the instrument item. An example of this could be grouping item responses um, from negative and positive phrasing. So instead of just going item by item, you begin to collect information based on a negative response by a participant and positive responses by participants. 
One pro for this analysis structure is that it makes information abundantly accessible to a reader. However, there are some cons. You have to do loads of work on the front end to identify trends, and you can call, it can cause reporter bias if you attempt to bend your answers to fit the trend. If you've used a pretest post test model for your data collection, you may want to continue this organization in your analysis section. You can do this by comparing specific before and after responses to items. And this could be done per subject or perhaps for a specific group in your study. One pro for this analysis structure is that it clearly shows results if change is present or not present. However, there are some cons. If you use this specific model, it might lack effect if there's very little change that occurs from pre and post data collection. And it can be incredibly repetitive for the reader. So keep that in mind. If your research focuses around a time element and in your research and your research is conducted over time as a critical component. So perhaps maybe like a growth over time study or repeated visits to a research site to measure, measure change, um, you might consider analyzing your results chronologically. So the pro for this is that it guides a reader through that analysis chronologically, which can increase clarity for the evolution of your data. However, there is a con as well. This is a time consuming process that can potentially become very difficult to place in a 5,000 word academic paper. And finally, if you spend time with your data, you may begin to see trends and then themes in your results. Grouping these together as an analysis structure could be very helpful. So some pros, uh, pros to this analysis structure, you have great, a great approach for secondary research as well as primary research. And this aids the reader in understanding key pieces of analysis which help with your line of reasoning. However, this also takes a lot of time for you as the researcher. You have to know your data, study your data, try to group your data, look at trends, and then also develop themes. Um, it's worth the effort if you, if you can, but um, just keep that in mind that you, you can't just automatically jump into this organization without some time on the front end. Okay, we've talked about organization. We've talked about the big picture, but good organization is not enough for a line of reasoning. How you structure your paragraphs will affect the clarity of your argument. So let's take a look at one way you can structure your line of reasoning paragraph by paragraph. Consider your paragraph structure as a cycle. Why a cycle? Pattern in your writing can begin to generate clarity and comfort to your reader while absorbing complex information, which will increase the engagement of your reader. Before I discuss the details of the cycle, I want to caution you. Pattern is great, but leaning too heavily on one pattern can also become monotonous. Peer revision is a great way to gauge when your analysis needs more or less pattern. One concept that I find helpful when writing is this. Each paragraph is one critical idea that helps answer your question. Each sentence in that paragraph is a moment of that idea. As you build each moment or sentence, the overall idea of the paragraph should grow stronger. If you find that you are juggling more than one critical idea in the same paragraph, you may confuse your audience. Again, sharing and receiving feedback from a peer revision will be critical in this process. So let's talk about this cycle. This cycle should occur in every paragraph of your analysis and you should have many paragraphs in this element. First up in the paragraph is your topic sentence. This sentence introduces the specific ideas you are discussing in that paragraph. Next, present your evidence to your reader. If this is the first time you're providing this evidence, be detailed in clarifying this evidence. However, do not attempt to take on an entire data set in one paragraph, as this may overwhelm your reader. Pick small chunks of data to share in each paragraph. Also, do not forget to reference the data visualizations you have shared in your academic paper. You probably worked really hard on making those graphs and other visualizations ap appealing to your audience. Make sure you share this hard work to increase reader engagement and effective consumption of your information. 
Next, you must explain your evidence to your reader. This will often require you to contextualize or place your information in the, in the overall study and research question. Analysis is up next. This should be the bulk of each paragraph. You should use the space to begin formulating small parts to the answer to your research question based on the evidence shared in this paragraph and possibly preceding paragraphs. No single analysis paragraph should, un should solve your research question. That is a behavior for your conclusion. Rather, each part of the analysis should provide one piece of the puzzle to your overall research question and answer. In addition to this characteristic, you should take time to return to previous scholarly works to discuss how your results connect to the results and findings of other studies in your community of practice. Finally, you may also consider synthesizing limitations of this evidence as it relates to your research question. I will talk about this behavior in the conclusion element as well. Lastly, do not forget your transitions. Transitions are the final piece to every single paragraph that links your current paragraph to the next paragraph. Imagine your reader is on one side of a ravine with no way to jump to the other side. Without transitions, this is the situation you are putting your reader in and this causes confusion, which can lead to a lack of engagement. Help your reader cross the ravine by building a bridge. This bridge or transition should be built at the end of the current paragraph and provide insight into the next paragraph's topic or idea. This connection should establish a relationship between the current paragraph topic and the next paragraph topic. If you need more support on how to formulate arguments in your AP Research Academic paper, visit the lesson entitled Effectively Defending Your Inquiry Choices. Sam has created a great spotlight on argumentation for you to review. Okay, that was a lot of information, so let's take some time to talk about what not to do in the discussion analysis or evaluation element. Finally, in the discussion analysis or evaluation element, do not summarize information from your literature review and do not summarize your results. Do not needlessly repeat data in both writing and visuals. And finally, do not jump to conclusions or assumptions, especially ones that are not backed by evidence. Lastly, we arrive at the conclusion and future directions element. So let's talk about what to do in this element. Make sure you provide a clear answer to your research question backed by and connected to your analysis. Review key takeaways from those analysis details. Explain how your conclusions are limited, considering the constraints of your data. Indicate how your conclusion, in, in, excuse me, your conclusion information agrees or disagrees with your community of practice and scholarly works in your literature review. Suggest practical future options of research for individuals who want to conduct research inspired by your work. And I wanted to pause and clarify two major terms for this element, your limitations and your implications. So for your limitations, you want to make sure that you are acting as a humble researcher and you discuss errors or other important issues during your method that could have limited the strength of your conclusion. And finally, make sure to show and describe the limits of your conclusions in relation to the community of practice. Things that you should not do when writing your limitations are to say that you solved all the things and therefore your conclusions are not limited. Do not complain about feasibility problems, your teacher or your expert advisor. Feasibility problems may include timing, as in, I did not plan correctly. When constructing your method, you should have considered how time will play a role in the possibility of collecting data. Your conclusion is not a place to complain about not having enough time. Funding, I could not pay for this million dollar experiment. When constructing your method, you should have considered the funding or lack of funding to conduct your research and then adjusted your method accordingly. And finally, lab and equipment access. My lab did not have this rare piece of equipment. Access to state-of-the-art equipment is something to consider before building your method. If you lost access, that's a different issue. But if you never had hope of accessing a piece of equipment, the conclusion is not a place for sharing that information. 
Remember, feasibility is something to consider from the start of the research process and should not be expressed as a complaint in your conclusion. The things you should do when writing your implications are to describe how this new and limited understanding could affect the subject and or participants of your study. You should also describe how this new and limited understanding changes the conversation of the community of practice. And this could be a, in a number of ways. You could talk about how your information contributes to the community of practice, how it agrees with the community of practice, or how it disagrees with the community of practice. But there are some things you should not do when writing your implications. Do not hyperbolically state that you have proven without a doubt that X is true or false or use any variation of that concept. Do not indicate that your research has overruled the research of prior investigations and do not indicate that no one else needs to continue research in this field. There are, all, are almost always future directions for research on a topic. Additional items that you should not do in this element include, do not add any new data as a plot twist or a surprise in your conclusion. All data should be presented in the findings and analysis elements. Do not make random assumptions and then do not make unreasonable recommendations for future research. So now that you have more information, let's do an activity with your writing. This guided practice requires you to have a draft already created. Let's review the steps together. The following slide contains key behaviors of different levels of success for an academic paper. These behaviors are based on the, the rubric for the AP Research Academic Paper. Return to your draft of the elements previously described and highlight your paper based on the behaviors in the chart on the next slide. Be honest with yourself and your draft. The more critical you are now about your work, the better. Also, feel free to use this technique in peer revision. You will notice that much of the language on this slide is not like that of the rubric, and that's on purpose. I wanted to give you workable chunks to use when reviewing your paper. So let's walk through each color and I will clarify as we go. You should highlight anything red in your draft if it looks like a summary of prior research that is off topic and floating in the elements from this lesson. Floating means your information is not relevant to your topic and is simply just there. Some people call this fluff and some people call this filler. If you have floating information or citations, you will want to find ways to either remove this content or redirect it to connect to your topic and analysis. You should highlight anything orange that is prior research which connects to your topic but is not linked to your analysis. Think about the paragraph cycle we discussed earlier. If you've broken the cycle with a paragraph of unconnected information, that is problematic for your reader. You should highlight anything yellow that uses language that shows a new understanding or conclusion that has moments where line, the line of reasoning is not clear. And then finally, you highlight anything yellow that uses analysis points that are not backed clearly by enough evidence. All right. You should highlight anything green that uses language that supports a new understanding or conclusion, that uses effective transitions and other techniques to clarify your line of reasoning, that uses analysis points, which are clearly backed by enough evidence, and when limitations and implications that fit the not to do category from this presentation. And then you should finally highlight anything blue that uses language that justifies a new understanding or conclusion, that has consistent transitions or other techniques to clarify your line of reasoning that has analysis points that are clearly backed by enough evidence, when you see logical clear limitations that connect to your conclusions, and when you see logical clear implications that connect to the community of practice. Remember, you must be objective and honest with yourself and your work when it comes to this activity. If you're struggling to do so, consider consulting a peer to complete this activity together.
feel free to pause this video now to work through the activity. It may take you some time, so come back when you're ready. Did you complete your highlighting? How did it go? Here are a few reflection questions to support the activity and to provide even more support when revising this part of your academic paper. So the questions for you to consider, which spots of your paper were in the red and orange categories? And why were these spots problematic? Where did you find moments in the green and blue categories? And how can you strengthen other parts of your paper to increase those green and blue behaviors? Where do you need to spend the most time revising? And then how can you ask help from a peer? Feel free to pause this video at this time to answer those questions and go back and revise your work. Wow, that was a lot of information for us to cover. Great job staying with me. So let's debrief. I just want to revisit each major point from this review session. However, if you need more specific details about these elements, make sure to go back and listen to the specific instructions for each concept discussed. All right, so let's revisit some major points. You need to present your results, findings, and evidence clearly. Not all graphs and other data visualizations are appropriate for your topic. Select these intentionally. Organize your analysis with the goal of answering your research question piece by piece. Establish and maintain structure in your paragraphs. Connect your analysis to the community of practice and include the limitations of your conclusions. Include the implications to the community of practice and justify decisions and conclusions throughout all the elements we discussed today. A quick note about device and internet access. We know that not all students have access to the internet or a device. We're working on solutions to help students get what they need to show their best work. If you need mobile tools or connectivity or know someone who does, you can reach out to us directly to let us know at the link below. Happy researching and of course, thanks for watching.